My name is Daniel Kerelsk and I'm a PhD student here at Chemical Technology. Uh, yeah, so I will help you to, to look at this uh, lab today. And I think before uh, we start any, any scan or any run, we just quickly have a look at the instrument itself. Um, I think this is quite uh, nice in a way that you can uh, access almost any parts of this instrument from the front. Uh, which uh, which is improved compared to the old instruments, I think, where you had to go from the back side and then, uh, yeah, if you wanted to take out some parts or anything from the machine. So we open the doors like that from the outside, and I guess uh, I guess you know that any standard defectometer contains usually four main parts or components. Sometimes we say. Uh, of course, the, one of the main is, um, is an X-ray source because obviously you need some X-ray source to produce X-rays. And I think in most of the diffractometers, especially on the lab scale, uh, the X-ray source is uh, a normal X-ray tube, which, which is the same here. We have a standard copper, uh, copper X-ray tube. So it's a copper uh, K-alpha radiation that we're getting out from that tube. And then the tube is here, it's uh, kind of hard to see because it's inside this chamber. It has to be cooled down all the time because it's a lot of heat production. Meanwhile we produce some x-rays. Then the next uh, component of any diffractometer is a system of optics. And I guess you know why we need the system of optics, perhaps. Well, uh, the main sort of purpose is to um, uh, is to make the size or dimensions of the beam the way we want it. And for that we usually have uh, different types of slits and the slit usually define the, the length of the beam. So if you have a very uh, narrow slit then the length of the beam will be very narrow. Uh, and also we can have uh, so-called uh, so-called uh, beam masks that define the, the width of the beam. So then we have a, a certain width of our beam and then you just put it in, basically just a frame. Uh, also we usually have like a, a system of solar slits. Okay, that's good. Uh, also we have, uh, for instance, solar slits and then you can see it's, um, it's some sort of a combination of uh, plates, metal plates basically. It's to get beam as parallel as possible on the way uh, to the sample and from the sample. And then system of optics might also contain different types of filters, uh, monochromators for instance if you want to get uh, uh, kind of a better clear and clear beam because we always have some unwanted radiation. Uh, both in the incident and the um, diffracted pathway. So both this part and this part is, is the system optics. Then of course we always have to have uh, our sample or specimen that we can also call it. And then uh, it's here, maybe I can... I don't know, I should maybe do that. Maybe I can remove this. I don't know, if you, maybe you can just come a bit closer. It's here, I mean here we put our sample. So it's just a standard regular sample stage and then you put your sample in here. And then in this machine we can have two options. We can put it manually by hand or we can also ask the uh, sample changer to put the sample in and take it out when it's done. Alright, and then the last part of any diffractometer is um, detector. Because of course we produce some signal so then we want to detect it, our x-rays basically. So in this uh, machine, that's the main advantage, I think, of the machine, is the detector because it's, um, it's a very fast detector that detects a very broad range of x-rays at once. That's why the machine is very fast. It's, uh, yeah, it's the fastest, I think, in its, uh, in its kind at the moment. So we can perform runs from uh, 4 to 30 seconds and, and, of course, up to unlimited time. And then usually the longer you scan, the better data you get, because then you get more and more refined data if you wait a bit longer at each, each step. 
as you probably know also that there are two I think two different types of samples it's either a powder sample and then uh, or it's a film sample and film it means that it's usually in form of some sort of a, a flat piece like uh, any flat piece of a metal for instance and in this lab we try to prepare two different powder samples and also we will analyze one flat sample that looks like a, a big film basically. To prepare a very standard powder sample we use a special it's so called a back loader so it looks like this just some kind of a some kind of a stage uh, this is a standard holder for a powder sample uh, in this machine it's comprised of two parts an upper part and then a bottom part so first we take an upper part and then we try to fix it on this uh, back loader we press this, we press this knob and then we put like this and then we try to find our sample I think uh, for this lab I have two different type it's um, potassium chloride and also it's some kind of um, a zeolite it's a zeolite X what was the first one? potassium chloride so we start from this one or I start from this one as you probably know uh, to be able to run a good extra D analysis we should have a, a specific kind of size of our particles in the powder sample uh, basically we should aim at uh, having a very fine powder so this is obviously uh, impossible to sort of put it directly in the sample holder and then in the machine you won't you will you won't get a good date you get a lot of noise and uh, the surface won't be flat or anything so before preparing a sample we will try to grind it a little bit and then uh, we don't need so much maybe just take a few like that and maybe this big one like that so just uh, It's not necessarily to apply a lot of force, but sort of a standard, I don't know, standard grinding. I guess you you will get used to that when you try it yourself later, for instance, if you need that. It's a bit hard to, of course, explain. But kind of try to make it nice and even powder sample so that you don't have any big clumps, for instance, or anything like that. Quite homogeneous. And that's also one thing, for instance, when you prepare uh, a, a bit more complicated samples, that here we have a potassium chloride and uh, perhaps it's, it's very pure, but what if you take a sample from, I don't know, if you go on a field experiment with like rocks or something, and then usually people collect a sample from a soil or something, and then of course it's usually a combination of many uh, compounds and substances. So what you have to make sure that you have a, you have it well mixed, that the sample is representative, for instance, and then it's the same when you try to grind it. So try to first kind of make it well mixed, maybe, and that you have all the parts when you grind it also, and then you will mix it once ground. I think it's good to remember. Okay, let's try to put it in now. I think it should be enough. So then you take it, don't take the, the whole spoon, maybe something like that, and then carefully sprinkle inside. And I usually start from the edges and then uh, going towards the middle a little bit. And then I usually fill the whole bottom.
something like that, you try to kind of fill it up uh, that you don't really see the edges and then you maybe make a little bit, a little of a hill kind of in the middle because then when you compress it it's better, it kind of spreads uh, down evenly I think or at least a bit more even. And also the good thing with this back loader is that uh, you don't really suffer from the orientation problem in this case because uh, for instance in the old machine or sometimes you have to prepare it uh, and then you fill up the sample holder and then the part that you're filling up from is actually the top part that will be exposed to the x-ray but in our case this will be the bottom part so the top part is uh, underneath kind of that so it's, it's basically intact so then we can sprinkle it the way we want it and, and yeah, we can be a little bit rough with that so that's kind of an advantage I think of this back uh, loader then you take it's called sort of a sample press or something make sure it's clean and then we try to compress it down to get a nice pallet of the pounder you can press quite hard and then it's a bit hard to say usually I think it's good of course to avoid any extra twisting or anything because you of course can uh, implement some or implicate some uh, orientation problems but some samples are very tricky that you probably have to kind of twist it and then slide it to actually get the sample in this uh, cavity but let's see what we get now if I just remove it I think it looks fine this is an easy sample so then we just take access with this knife to close it nicely with the bottom part that's the only purpose and also have it of course it's good to have it as flat as possible on this side so then the upper side is not falling down for instance because of any uh, roughness or unevenness just do like that and then we take a brush and clean clean it a little bit because I think this is important to have to have it clean so we can close it nicely later okay I'm gonna take the bottom part with this and then just close it and then it's very important to first flip it over like this and have it on your on your hand and then press this knob to lose the sample and then you can also clean a little bit of this part So our goal is to get this surface as flat as possible and as even as possible. I think it looks fine to me. Uh, maybe someone can pass me this sample changer. Thank you. So then you see here we can put up to 15 samples. So we just put this one uh, in the first position for instance like that. Then I think all the samples now ready. So maybe someone can uh, put it in, for instance, so we get some, I don't know, anyone that is willing to do that? If it's a handle, so this will be inner, this will be outer. So you hold it okay. here and then you drag it like this. All right, yeah, then you slide it out. And then, as you can see here, we have three available positions where we can put the sample changer and then they all have names it's A, B and then it's C okay. and I usually put it in A because it's the most logical so I don't know if you want to put it in A so you can put it in C like this? exactly and then just try to yeah maybe put it in C it actually will create some extra work later because all the default settings are for A so they'll have to change that and then you make sure that it seats nicely and I think it's, uh, it's perfect, it uh, doesn't look like it's any gap or anything, so it looks very firm. So then you can just close the door.
All right, so now we are done with the sample preparation and then uh, everything is in, so we can just try to make a program with the settings that we want to use for this scan. Uh, the evaluation or the software to operate the instrument is called data collector. So we start this data collector and then uh, we have to log in. And then I think I will log in with my super secret password. Oh, that I forgot, of course. All right, so the first thing what we should do is to connect computer to the instrument or, or actually instrument to the computer. And then when we press that we usually get some sort of mm, choices. And the choices are different sample stages that we can use. So maybe I can also show one sample stage if I just quickly open it again. For instance here they say which one you want to use and then this last one stage flat samples it looks like this it's the most simple sample stage that you can sort of get in this machine and it's only used for flat samples and then I think um, you have to have quite big sample and then that it kind of fits exactly here for instance, if you have a sample that is looking like this, then it's kind of ideal maybe to use this one because it's so easy, you can just put it like this and then it will be standing here and then you put it in the machine. So it's quite quite simple sample stage, but you need to have sample that, that fits here nicely and then it sticks out quite a lot. Uh, then uh, we have this other standard reflection transmission sample stages. These two are the same, it's just slightly different configuration. It's exactly what we have now inserted and also we can use a furnace as a sample stage. For instance, if you want to start the uh, x-ray at a different temperature and sometimes it's very important maybe to um, get the knowledge about the expansion for instance of the or changing of the unit cell. So you can put it in the, inside the furnace and then start heating it and then the machine will take the data every, every now and then. But for now we use the standard reflection configuration sample stage. So now it's connecting and then usually get some warnings and the warnings are uh, settings that machine thinks we have. Oh perfect, that's good to close actually, but it's not that critical at the moment. Okay, so now I just click OK. And then you can see that it should try, I think now, okay, now it won't try anything, but sometimes it tries to check the safety for the sample changer. Um, as you probably know, in order to get a specific x-rays, you have to have specific settings on the x-ray tube. Because it, I guess you know that if it's a bit too low, for instance, tension and current, then you never get um, uh, characteristic x-rays, you always get this uh, background radiation. So 30 and 10 are standby values when the tube is not used and then uh, we don't produce any uh, K-alpha radiation for instance. And then uh, operating conditions are 45, 40, so 45 kilovolt and then 40 milliampere for this particular tube. And then I usually go stepwise from 45 20 to 45 40 and then you can see here that these numbers they are changing like if you look now for instance I, I will change it to 40 and then then it's changing you see so now for instance we have our uh, operating conditions 45 40 then we just click OK uh, the basic principle with panalytical instrument, the one that we have now, is to create so-called uh, programs. And then the programs can be of different purpose. Uh, the main type of programs is uh, so-called uh, scan setting program, maybe you can say it like that. Where you write down all the settings that you want to have during the scan, and we also write down 
uh, or assign basically all the instrument components that you have now. That's what we try to do. So we just go to File, New, and then we create Absolute Scan. Second type of programs that we can have is, is the sample changer, or it's for sample changer. Sort of now we created the program with all the settings that we want to use. So now we need to create a program for the machine, sort of to say what sample to take at which time and what program to use for that particular sample. And it's called sample changer batch with this configuration. So we just go insert. So basically we pick our we pick our program and then we pick a folder where we want to save the data all right now maybe I should put uh, that I think maybe. So here we write, we can see that it's uh, calling for position, position A1, so it's A and then it's 1. And then we write the sample ID, it's basically the sample name. So for instance first one was <coughs> potassium chloride, so I write like that. And then the easiest is to copy this line when we want to use exactly the same program for instance. So then we don't have to change this part, we can just change position A2 and then it's a zeolite x and then we go here and we change it to position A3 and that is alumina disk. Alright, so then you see the total time becomes now about 15 minutes. So we save it also. as a batch program and then you can just uh, give a very general name like three samples for instance so now we have created the program for running the program for the machine so then it's just to run it so we go to measure and pick our program basically that we have and we have to pick now our batch program for the sample changer So then we have position A1, A2, A3, that looks correct, and then sample name also looks quite correct. So then we click OK, and then you can see that it will try to pick up now the sample, put it in, go back. Then it's positioning the detector and everything. And now it started. This was the easy part to sort of prepare a sample and then uh, ask the machine to run. And then the sometimes a nightmare is to evaluate the data to get something out of the of the diffractograms. And that is very tricky. I guess for us it will not be that difficult because the samples are quite easy but usually people come with a very complicated uh, samples and then yeah contain they containing a lot of different compounds and everything and then you can have yeah a variety of different diffractograms and peaks and whatever it is but then anyway to start uh, you use a special uh, evaluation software and usually this software is, um, uh, it comes with, a, with the instrument. So it's um, different, for instance, uh, different manufacturers use different software to evaluate the data. This one is called Highscore Plus, that's the analytical uh, software. Highscore Plus. So then we just open our files, we go and look for them. Do -do 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 
data files group one I think I can actually open all of them at once so then it's a very standard layout they are open as a, as a tab here and then you can see that we have now our diffractogram okay looks like this looks fine to me from the very quick look we get peaks and quite nice background for this looks okay I think here as well and then um, yeah looks okay uh, in order to continue you as a as an operator you have to do some steps the first I think step is to determine the background or so where you want to draw the line sort of a background line and that you need to in order to evaluate then the height of the peaks and, and compare that to the reference data for instance then the second step is to try to uh, mathematically describe your peaks basically try to feed the peaks and put some kind of a mathematical model to each peak again to evaluate the area of the peak for instance right to compare it later with the reference data uh, also you can try to mathematically for instance strip some unwanted radiation which can be like k beta radiation a k alpha 2 radiation you can do it mathematically you don't know how uh, it's yeah quite reliable but of course it's just a mathematical stripping and then you can do some other also things those I think are kind of basics is the background uh, fitting the profile and then um, stripping this k alpha 2 and k beta radiation for instance and you can do it manually you can do all things manually or you can also ask the software to do it for you and I think that's what I, I'm going to do now because uh, otherwise it I mean it might take a very long time to do a very nice manual fitting so if I now ask the machine to just do all this uh, treatment background stripping and so on and so on and also by pressing that button I ask the machine to do uh, a match search and match so it will try to identify uh, what it is by comparing to the um, reference uh, diffractograms that we have in the database and the database I think there are two main databases or oh, it's actually one main database that's called PDF it's a powder diffraction files I think and that one is extremely expensive and we have it here I think we pay maybe 30,000 per year for this uh, license to have this uh, access to the database uh, but th there is also a free database I think it's called COD which is quite good I think but it's I think it contains like, twice less number of um, uh, reference uh, diffractogram in it but I think it's also I mean it's a good database to start with sometimes if you I mean then you have to pay for instance and such things okay so we've done now the machine or the software has completed the evaluation of the diffractogram so if you for instance look closer like here this line is the background that is determined to be and then you can either agree or disagree I mean manually you can then for instance make it uh, differently that it maybe fits a bit better or something so this is quite approximate of course this automatic uh, treatment then the blue line it tried to mathematically describe the peak basically and did here and here so if you just continue it did everywhere and then the last step what I think it also stripped this K beta radiation and everything and then it tried to compare and we actually got a nice result so the machine thinks that this is aluminum oxide and that's what we have <laughs> that's very good I think you so we can and it's even alpha aluminum oxide which we should have so it's very very good I think for us so for instance this was the reference that the machine used Thank you.